we have learned that the work done by a force is the force times the displacement times cosine the angle between the force and the displacement. For example, here I have a box that's being pulled by the slanted force F to the right for a distance D. The reason why we multiply by cosine the angle between the force and the displacement is because this slanted force has two components, one perpendicular to the displacement, the other one is parallel to the displacement, and it is the parallel component that does the work. The component of the force that is perpendicular to the displacement does not do work. So another way to find the work done by that force is to find the parallel component of the force, the component of the force that is parallel to the displacement, times the displacement times cosine the angle between the parallel component and the displacement. Because this component is already parallel to the displacement, that means that they can either be in the same direction, which means the angle is zero degrees, or in opposite directions, that means that the angle is 180 degrees. For a swinging pendulum, the tension in the string does no work to the pendulum bob, because at any moment during the swing, the tension is perpendicular to the displacement, and the cosine 90 degrees is zero. Now let's go back and look at the box. If there is friction between the box and the table, then I can ask you to find the work done by friction, which means this is the friction times the displacement times cosine the angle between the two. Friction would go back to the left when the displacement goes that way. That means this is a cosine 180. And cosine 180 is negative 1. So the work done by kinetic friction is negative. If the work done by a force is positive, say positive 5 joules, that means the force gives 5 joules of energy to the object. If the work done is negative, that means the force takes energy away from the object. In the case of kinetic friction, it does negative work, it takes energy away from the object and turns it into heat. Now let's look at this box on the incline. The box slides down the incline for distance d. Let's find the work done by mg. The work is uh, mg, which goes straight down, times the displacement, which goes slanted like this, times the cosine, the angle between the mg and the d. The angle between mg and d would be this angle right here. And here I have a right triangle. So if that angle is theta, this angle would be 90 degrees minus theta. So that's 90 degrees minus theta. Or we can use the, the parallel component of the force. We know that the mg's component along the incline is uh, mg sine theta, which goes down the incline and then times the displacement d, which goes down the incline too. That means that in this case, we have cosine zero degrees. So of course, we're gonna end up with the same thing because uh, cosine 90 degrees minus theta is sine theta. And cosine zero degrees is one. What if the box slides up the incline for distance d? What would the work done by mg be? If we look at the parallel component, the component of mg that's parallel to the incline is the mg sine theta, which goes down the incline when the displacement goes up the incline. So the angle between the two is 180 degrees, and cosine 180 is negative 1. If the force and the displacement are in opposite directions, the force would do negative work. If we have a one-dimensional situation and we're given a force versus position graph, then which part of the graph gives us uh, the work? Because work is force times displacement, if we're multiplying the force times delta x, that means uh, if we're multiplying, that's the area of the graph. We also talked about the work energy theorem. The work done by all of the forces equals to the work done by the net force, which equals to the change in kinetic energy of the object. 
This basically is energy conservation. The kinetic energy of an object cannot change unless if we got forces giving it energy or taking its energy away. For example, a cart with mass m travels to the right at speed vo. What average force would it take to stop this cart in distance d? For this problem, we can either use kinematics with forces or the work energy theorem. Because we know the initial velocity and the final velocity is zero and the displacement is d, we know three things. That means we can use the kinematics equations to find the acceleration and then use f equals to ma to find the force. If we use the work energy theorem, then the work done by the net force is the force times the displacement times the cosine the angle between the two. Now to stop the cart, we would push that way. So the net force will go that way and then the displacement goes this way because the cart will continue to travel to the right. The angle between the two is uh, 180. And delta K is the uh, final kinetic energy minus the initial kinetic energy. Since the cart comes to a stop, the final kinetic energy is zero. And then cosine 180 is negative 1, so the negative and this negative cancel. And so the net force times the displacement equals to the initial kinetic energy, which is 1 half m times vo squared. So if we divide by d on both sides, we get that average net force that's required to stop the cart. In this unit, we categorize the forces into conservative forces and non-conservative forces. And what's special about a conservative force is that the work done by a conservative force only depends on the initial and the final positions. It does not depend on the path it takes. In this unit, we learned about two conservative forces. One is the gravitational force, mg. The other one is the force of a spring, that is negative kx. The negative tells us that this spring's force is a restoring force. But when we use this in problem solving, usually we just need the f equals to kx. We use it to find the magnitude of the force. Because the work done by a conservative force only depends on the initial and final positions. So for every conservative force, we can define a potential energy for it. For mg, we have the gravitational potential energy that is uh, mgy. For the spring's force, we have the potential energy stored in a spring that is uh, 1 half kx squared. If we consider the potential energy, then the work energy theorem will be like this. The work done by the non-conservative forces would equal to the change in total mechanical energy, and the total mechanical energy includes the kinetic energy and the potential energy. This means the total mechanical energy would change only if there are non-conservative forces such as friction, air resistance, or applied force to take energy away or to put in energy. Now let's take a look at springs. In this course, we learned about springs that follow the Hooke's law. They are also called ideal springs or linear springs. The little k here is the spring's force constant. The x is the stretched or compressed amount. Let's say this linear spring has a length of 0.2 meters when there's a 5 kilogram box hung under it. The length is 0.24 meters when there's a 7 kilogram box there. What is the force constant of this spring? For this problem, we cannot say the force is kx, the force is the weight of the box 50 equals to k times 0.2, because 0.2 meters is the total length of the spring. It is not the compressed amount or stretched amount, so this does not work. But because this is a linear equation, that means we can look at the difference because the delta F would equal to delta kx. And since k is a constant we can take out, so this is k times delta x. So we just have to look at the change. If we start with 5 kilograms, and that means that we 
if when we add two extra kilograms, we're adding twenty extra newtons of force, and that makes the spring stretches an extra point oh four meters. So this will give us the k. It is five hundred, and the unit for the force constant is newtons per meter because it's force divided by the stretched amount. When we put two springs together in parallel like this, the equivalent force constant is K1 plus K2. We get a bigger force constant because to stretch the springs by the same amount, we have to pull harder on the combination than on an individual spring. If they are in series, this is how we can find the equivalent force constant. We get a smaller force constant because if we pull with the same force, the combination would stretch more than an individual spring.